introduce you our uh, our today's speaker, Professor Glober Silva, uh, who comes from Federal University of Alagoas in Brazil, very far away from us. So he will talk about acoustic radiation force and torque in acoustic fluidics. So in case if you have any questions, please either raise your hand or you may uh, type your question in the chat. Uh, or you may ask at the end of the uh, of the seminar as well as you wish, but please do not interrupt uh, the speaker just in the middle of the sentence. So please, Professor Silva, uh, the stage is yours. You're welcome. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Maxim, and thanks, Mihail, for, for the invite. It's really a great pleasure uh, to be here participating in the series of your seminars at ITMO University. And uh, I'm from uh, Federal University of Alagoas, Brazil, right on the Atlantic Ocean. So the city is called Maceo, is, is a coastal city. Uh, it's definitely very warm, I guess, compared to St. Petersburg standards. But uh, with this brief introduction and, and, and said, uh, let's get to work and talk about uh, the acoustic radiation force and torque in the context of acoustic fluidics. So uh, the outline of my presentation has uh, four parts, divided in four parts, an introduction, where I talk about acoustic fluidics and some historical landmarks of radiation force. And I introduce uh, from first principles, uh, uh, the main acoustic fields, which is a name for the acoustic radiation force and torque. So it's been called the uh, mean acoustic fields now. Show some results for particles, spherical,s and spherical particles and, and non-spherical or non-isotropic particles as well. Um, and then uh, show you some technology or in this field where we can uh, apply for a biospectroscopy of cells with some experimental uh, results. And then I come up with the conclusions of the talk. Um, what is acoustic fluidics? Well, it's, it's, a very, it's a very simple idea. You, the recipe is get the forces uh, present in ultrasonic waves and combine the forces and torques as well uh, in microfluidic uh, units. Uh, micro reactors, uh, micro channels, and you can use this force to, to handle cell. This is also called uh, acoustophoresis, which means move with, uh, with uh, acoustics. Uh, you have different uh, effects that you, you can uh, also handle particles or cells. For example, we have the electrophoresis, we have optophoresis magnetophoresis, all in the realm of uh, microfluidics, which uh, in turn uh, handles very small portions of, of fluids. Let's, let's think few microliters and less going even to picoliters. Uh, and uh, you have uh, a scale, a linear scale of 100 micrometers for the width of, of channels and microenvironments. Uh, some features of acoustic fluidics, the important one is the frequency range, and that determines a lot of how your radiation force and torque will behave. And you can have strong forces for the micro, uh, micro scale world, uh, ranging up to uh, uh, micro newtons. So this is really a punch if you think about a cell with 10 micrometers average size. Um, so what we can do with acoustic fluidics, we can do some levitation here. Um, we can, so you can see here, we have this parking sensors, ultrasonic sensors. This is in air, but the idea goes for liquids as well, that most uh, biological assays take place. You can pattern cells and particle here. This is a work that appeared in, in Nature Communications by a, an Australian group. So you can really see that the particles are, are neatly arranged there. And as they, they comes in this microchamber, this is the actual setup. 
and then you see the scale up here. Um, you can separate particles by size, but you could separate also uh, by mechanical properties. Here you separate five and seven micrometer particles. Five micrometer particles go to bottom and top channels here in the video, and the seven micrometer goes to, to the channel right in front of the flow here. So here you have a sketch of what is going on, and that appears in analytical chemistry back in 2015. And you can also trap uh, microparticles. If they're soft, you can deform as you just saw here. Um, so uh, that is an effect of the radiation stress over the surface of a soft particle. So this is a microvesicle with 10 micrometers uh, diameter. And then you really see that uh, initially you are in a, in a position and then you move to a certain equilibrium position and then the, the particle is, is deformed again. And you see the video. So this is just a few examples, that, but there's plenty of things that uh, several groups around the world are doing. And this actually was done by myself in a collaboration with the University of Bristol. Glover, I'm, we... sorry, I'm, I'm so, oh, sorry for, for, for interrupting. Yeah, but what are the typical forces here? You said that it's up to, generally up to uh, micron, micron newtons, right? But then right. what is... So this? typical forces in, in these configurations that, that I showed, except for the levitation in air, is about uh, nano... Uh, newtons uh, and it's its surface to to move and to deform soft uh, particles uh, so I, I can tell you here is nano newtons that's that's a good point that you asked um, okay so um, so it's always good to have a historical perspective of of the field. And, and there is uh, three pioneer papers, uh, one uh, in 1934 that study, it was the first theoretical description of uh, radiation pressure, radiation force on uh, a sphere. So here it was considered a rigid sphere. So there is no energy penetration on, on the object. And uh, eventually in 1955, a group from Japan introduced compressibility. You know that the sound waves, uh, when they propagate, they, they compress and they expand. So the particles, material particles, in fact, do that as well. So the rigid approximation is to make an idea. Okay, so here is closer to what you have in a lab. And it was a, a, a seminal paper by Lev Gorkov uh, from that time, the Soviet Union. Uh, in 62, 1962, where he came up with a very elegant theory to explain the forces in terms of a, a potential uh, energy potential. So I will talk about that later, but I want to actually praise the three papers in the field because they, they introduced uh, the physical description of radiation force. There were other papers in radiation torque, which is a sister effect. And uh, so we go along with that in a moment. Uh, so we have to, to understand this effect, we have to, to step down and think in terms of linear momentum conservation. So imagine that you have your particle here, uh, which is going to be subjected to uh, radiation force or torque and just fix your particle in a coordinate system and you can enclose the particle with a control surface. So this is pretty much a description way to understand the effect. Uh, so uh, an incident field carries linear momentum. In fact, it's, it's going to carry a linear momentum flux. So everything that gets into this control surface with S sub zero here, and you have the normal, will uh, interact with the particle. And that will actually change the, the incident linear momentum. So we have 
here depicted the scattered waves. So all the momentum that enters this region enclosed by S sub zero is the, uh, the stress tensor from uh, uh, fluid dynamics, which is, uh, can be read as a momentum flux. And there is the Raynaud's Raynaud, uh, stress tensor, which is, you see here, momentum. Uh, density because you have here a mass density times the fluid velocity all projected onto the normal of S sub zero surface. So when I integrate all over the surface, I have everything that is coming in uh, my region. And, and that will change the momentum in the bulk fluid here between the particle and the control surface. So this, just by the way, this surface does not exist. It's just a way to describe things here. And this is the surface. S is a function of time. So this surface may move, deform. Uh, and because I don't have this term here, the Reynolds stress tensor is a term of convection. So I transport momentum throughout uh, a medium. So I cannot transport momentum, uh, this type of momentum from convection and by the particle because they're two different media. So the only uh, interaction I have is mediated by the uh, stress tensor sigma, okay? So and then I take time average over uh, the period of my incident wave. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about here um, uh, single frequency waves, okay? So I have only one frequency. So the, the, the over bar here at the notes, time average over this, the, the period of, of your read. So when you do that, and because the time average of the time derivative is zero, uh, I come up with the definition of the radiation force, the force that will arise, which is an average force or a mean force, is, is simply I integrate the, the total momentum flux projected onto uh, the normal on my control surface. So this is a conservation of momentum that I'm using. And, and it comes uh, that I can define um, a radiation torque with respect to my, uh, to my coordinate system, the origin of my coordinate system, only by adding a momentum arm here and integrating over again my control surface. So, so this is the two definitions. Okay, go ahead. Glover, I see some question from the audience. So, Vanya, okay. please. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, you've said that uh, you're considering only single frequency waves. So, that's why you have this average, uh, which uh, turns to zero. But have you ever seen papers uh, which are considered two frequencies, uh, which, for example, close to each other? And uh, I expect there might be some beatings between, between those. Uh, close frequencies. Have you ever considered this one? Yes, yes. There, uh, there, are, there are a couple of papers that use two or more uh, frequencies. And then you have uh, the beat uh, uh, wave as well. And the effect that will come out is your, your particle will have uh, a force at the difference frequency or bit frequency, if, if you want. So this is also in the literature reported to, to mm -hmm. answer mm -hmm. your question. But here I'm interested on, on single frequencies wave only. You could, you could extend that to, to more discrete frequencies and, and there are exper experiments with that as well. So okay, there, is, there is another question in the chat uh, from Ilya Diri. So why do we have uh, the dependence on time uh, on the surface of integration if we can choose this surface arbitrarily? So it's like some clarification about the formula. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is, uh, maybe I should have written here as, uh, as a function of time. So this surface here is not this one here. So this one is fixed in, let's say, a laboratory frame. And this particle here can move around uh, uh, by the action of the incident uh, linear momentum or can deform as well. So this is the reason why this uh, surface here uh, may depend on time. Right. But, the trick, but the trick here is to use the conservation of momentum because then instead of integrating things here, this, this momentum flux here, 
I'll integrate in the fixed surface, which is easier because I don't need to, to keep track of the, the particle movement. That's the trick. Thanks. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, so these are the, the uh, fluid dynamic equations. You have mass conservation, you have Navier-Stokes or momentum conservation, and you have energy. You may say, well, where is energy? Well, you can always work with the thermodynamic relations and we, we replaced energy uh, for entropy. This is for illustration purpose only, and entropy and temperature. This is illustration purpose only uh, because I wanna show you that you have to solve these equations if you wanna solve um, the radiation force and torque problem or the mean acoustic fields as as i said yeah. um, no, no, i'm sorry i'm sorry so for interrupting because uh, no, uh ahead, just just to, to make it clear but still we are working in in this in, in harmonic so we're not still in a har we didn't move to harmonic uh uh let's say domain right so or right right uh, a single frequency domain is, is still is still on That's yeah, but my, then, then I have a bit of a bit naive question from the previous slide when you're okay. When you averaged the time derivative. Uh, does it does it correspond to that? It's got, it gives you zero. That does it correspond to stationary case, right? Or how? stationary case? Yeah. Well, the, yeah. The time average of a time okay. derivative is is zero for when you have a harmonic field. For either either if you have stationary case or harmonic field, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Oh no, because... no okay, so no, no, the, the wave is harmonic. So mm -hmm. this part here comes with a harmonic wave, okay, yeah. but it has a single frequency. But the the effect mm -hmm. of uh, linear momentum transports throughout the fluid and the interaction with the particle will arise as a stationary effect. Right, right. Yeah, yeah because if, if we will consider some uh, uh, like mm, transient process when you turn okay. on the pulse, yeah, turn okay. on the the, uh, the the wave, yeah, then it takes some time to accumulate energy in this in, in this uh, artificial surface also, yeah. So on that on that transient process, this time this averaging of time derivative would not be zero. No, what? No, absolutely. You're gonna have movement uh, in, in the buildup of the stationary. Build up, right? Exactly. Yes, and the buildup for the stationary state. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have uh, lots of things that I'm not modeling here. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I simply consider the ideal case when you switch on your your wave, it's gonna be right away uh, a stationary state, which is of course non-physical. But for the sake of of, of the argument. Uh, it works uh, uh, pretty pretty fine because uh, and if, if if you're not if you're not if your time scale is, is, is much larger than the, the transient scale, you don't need to bother uh, at this level. But of course, you can you can try to study transient effects here with the formalism. But I'm not going to do that. All right, okay. I just wanted to make it clear. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Good. And maybe one more question related to, to this sigma tensor. So do I understand correctly that the viscosity, if it is present, it's all incorporated in, in this stress tensor, uh, which... Yes, yes. I will, I will show in detail this uh, stress tensor and all the components that make up the, the this field. And then you have uh, uh, vis viscous, uh, shear effects, and you have compression now and thermodynamic pressure as well. I'll show it explicitly very soon if you... Right, if you, Okay. Uh, as I was saying, it's, it's actually right here. Um, so you have the, the fluid dynamic equations, um, uh, mass conservation, momentum conservation, and energy conservation. Uh, and you have a bit of uh, tensor algebra here with the double... Uh, scalar product is a contraction. Um, but you have the stress tensor here is the thermodynamic pressure minus the thermodynamic pressure and is the unit uh, tensor here. And then you have the, the, the shear part, which is the Newtonian uh, fluid. And you have the Stokes hypothesis here for to correct for uh, compressibility of, of, your, of your fluid. There's a lot of things in fluid dynamics that consider uh, incompressible flows, but this is not our case. So that adds a bit 
of more uh, a, a bit of complexity in the description of of the main acoustic field phenomena so but this is exactly what i'm saying so here is the dynamic viscosity here's the bulk viscosity and these are quantities that may depend on the thermodynamic state of your fluid and um, well th this this system of equation is notoriously uh, difficult to be to be solved in a head-on attempt, okay? Uh, and, and then at the end, if you wanna have a more amenable, uh, if you get rid of, of, of entropy in favor of pressure and, and temperature, you can use the, the exact differentials here from thermodynamics. And so here comes up the, the heat capacity of constant pressure. This is a, a volume expansion coefficient beta. This is um, the isothermal uh, compressibility. So all thermodynamic parameters. And I, 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 I show that for, let's say, part of illustration purpose, but this is the basis that the description of mean acoustic fields are, are built upon. Um, I, cannot, I cannot go and do a head-on calculation. I need to do an approximated method. So I use perturbation theory. And the heart of perturbation theory is to choose um, a perturbation parameter. And here, uh, because I know from the laboratory that uh, the amplitude of the fluid velocity is much smaller than the speed of sound. So here's the example of the speed of sound in water at 25 Celsius. Uh, usually, this in the laboratory, the, the amplitude of the fluid velocities is, is few uh, millimeters per second. So I chose the Mach number as my perturbation parameters. And then I expand uh, my, my fields that I want to solve for the, for the mean acoustic fields in terms of this parameter. So the superscript denotes the order. So I have first order here and I have first uh, power, uh, power to power one and power two here and second order for all for pressure density, fluid velocity and temperature. So, and the fields are all harmonic in the sense that I have a complex uh, a function here, e to minus i omega t, omega is my angular frequency and single frequency, and the uh, spatial part of my fields are denoted in this notation, okay? So what, I, what I'm going to do is to, to, to grab all this expansion and plug into the conservation equations of the fluid, and separate them in linear, a system of linear equation, a system of a second order equation. Why I want to go up to second order? Why, why is that? That is actually related to the, the, the mean effect, to time average effect. Let's see some properties here. Uh, the time average of a harmonic function, well, uh, the way to read this, I take the, the real part, of this quantity, because this is something that I can measure in the lab. So I take the real part of this complex uh, function here, and it is zero. So I integrate that over a period of wave, I get zero. When I have the product of two functions, harmonic functions at the same frequency, I get one half of the real part of the product with the second uh, function uh, taking the, the conjugate, complex conjugate. I mean, you could take for the first uh, function as well. It doesn't matter because you take the real part. So, sorry, um, I see some, some question from Andre. Okay. Okay. Andre, please. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm sorry then for this silly question, uh, but uh, what about the Brownian motion? In principle, uh, as well as for harmonic dependence, the mean average value of the field will be equal to zero. Uh, uh, but uh, if you will uh, try to count the mean uh, displacement uh, due to the brown in motion, we will see that it's also proportional to the um, square root of time or something like this. So we will you count this is, is how, how important in, in, in your model this Brownian motion. Or, or your particle is quite large for this? Yeah, well, particles usually, if you think about like cells over one micrometer, 
uh, radius, or let's let's select one micrometer as a, as a scale. Uh, but Brownian motion, Brownian motion is a, is a shy. Let's see. Well, you see, you see some Brownian things going on even in that scale. But if you go to nanoparticles, then you you have definitely to consider uh, Brownian motion. Uh, the model goes independently, even if we have to consider a Brownian motion. Uh, you can you can you can set like parallel models. You can work with the fluid dynamics, and you can work with. Uh, uh, statistical thermodynamics to describe Brownian motion uh, in, in the system. But for the sake of simplicity, I will stick with larger particles and I won't care about Brownian motion here. But it can be, it can be added as, uh, you know, as a side effect, depending, as you mentioned, in, on the scale of, of your particle. But I, oh. I, I will consider the forces here uh also much stronger than the brownian forces that push the particle randomly in the medium okay so thank you, uh, thank you. no problem uh so because of this properties it leads to uh linear fields will be zero all first order fields will average zero so if i want to see the uh, average effect of on the mean acoustic fields uh, I have to go at least to second order. First order is going to give me oscillation. So this is not what I'm looking for here. I'm looking for a steady state forces and torques. So I have to go one step further. So this is the reason I expanded the fields to second order. So the second order now, which I call radiation stress, is not the, the stress tensor, but the, this is the radiation stress tensor. So this is superscript uh, rad up here it involves um, the stress tensor in second order the average and the average of the Reynolds stress tensor or momentum flux here so I just uh, wrote down with with this notation that I'm using for the perturbation theory so these are the fields that I have to plug in and integrate this guy here in order to compute forces and torques in my particles uh, that I or that I want to to analyze. So this is pretty much just the second. So you see, the, just pay attention to this. You see, like products of linear terms, uh, they they add up. So this is a second order term. Okay. So this is the idea of the perturbation theory. Um, I have the first order equations here. This is for the completeness of of this talk. Uh, I don't intend to solve these equations here because they're it's it's. It's an elaborate solution, and that I wouldn't have much time to do that now. But if you see, I have basically I have an equation involving the density for the, uh, the conservation of mass. Uh, I have the conservation of momentum and the conservation of energy here. These three equations and a, a thermodynamic relation between pressure and temperature. So uh, the, the, the point here is I can solve this for pressure, temperature, and fluid velocity. When, when I do that, I learn that there is three modes of wave propagation in my, my problem. I have, I have let's, let's consider that I have a compressional wave. This is one mode, comp the compressional waves moving, and it hits a particle here. And then close to the particle's boundary, you have uh, a thermal mode and you have a shear or viscous mode within the so-called boundary layers. So this, uh, this modes, thermal and shear modes, they die out very, very fast in terms of distance to the boundary. So in the bulk fluid, you have pretty much an inviscid or non-viscous or, or non-thermoviscous region, only compressional waves will survive. Uh, this, is, this comes out from the solution of these equations here. Um, and then you have, uh, the, you have the thickness for the viscous boundary layer and thermal boundary layer. And this is the scattered wave, and you have the inviscid region. So if I place my control surface where I integrate my radiation stress in the inviscid region, 
I'm, I don't need to bring this mode here in, in my stress tensor. So this is a simplification that I can do. And the second order averaged equation, so I, I have to go and check them. So they have source terms that are given in blue uh, here. And then I have to solve these two equations to get the press, second order pressure averaged and second order fluid velocity. Uh, these equations actually describe a micro streaming effect around this particle, which is also a steady state um, effect. And that was uh, worked out by two groups, a 97 uh, from Russia and the other group from, from Denmark more recently. Um, so these are the equations we want to solve if you want to obtain the radiation stress tensor that will give you the radiation force and radiation torque. Um, of course, that's, there is also a boundary condition. And there's a lot of physical parameters that you have to feed your model. I just showed this table here just for you to have uh, an idea of you have 10 parameters here that you need to know from your, your surrounding fluid and you need to know the properties of your particle or cell. Uh, here is considered as an elastic solid. And here are the parameters. I'm not, uh, well, of course, I, I don't need to read that, but it's just for, uh, for the record. And you have the boundary conditions that is very common in physics. You uh, require continuity of fields across uh, the medium that you're working with. So you have fluid to particles, so you require uh, continuity of, of temperature. Uh, you require continuity of the stress tensor, not the radiation stress, this is the stress tensor. And there's the heat flux as well, uh, inner and outer regions, and the fluid Velocity. So here you have, if you have a, a solid particle, of course you have uh, uh, the velocity of the element of your solid particle. So just just to make sure that we're not, but you can consider fluid particle as well. But thinking about solid particles like cells, uh, then you have the displacement uh, changing in time. So that gives the the velocity of uh, an element. And in the far field, you have the Sommerfeld radiation condition. So either you solve your problem numerically or analytically, uh, you have to take care of all these parameters and the boundary conditions uh, plus your equations to get to the radiation stress tensor. Um, we, well, I limit my analysis to weak viscosity approximation where I compare the contribution of the, the micro streaming velocity, which is the average of the second order fluid velocity, and the micro streaming pressure. I'm sorry, there is a bar here. Um, I just forgot to type. And when you compare this according to your perturbation scheme, you see the ratio in your radiation stress tensor that you have a contribution from the gradient of the microstreaming velocity to the, the pressure related, the average pressure related to that effect. And then you come up with this parameter that I called a microstreaming number. Uh, the microstreaming number gives you um, viscosity on top here, and then you have um, uh, something related to the bulk uh, uh, bulk modules of your fluid times the, the, the size of your, of your particle or characteristic size of your particle. So looking at here, so if you go to like larger particles, the contribution of micro streaming goes down in water to a part in a thousand or a part in 10,000 approaching here. But if I go to nanoparticles, I, I I have to be careful. Water is okay. I put water as a limit here and olive oil is an upper limit here, just for illustration. And then you see they go neck and neck if I under uh, one micrometer in, in approaching an olive oil parameters and they really uh, get cl uh, high contribution. So they have equivalent contributions that I have to, 
to take that into account. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take that into account because most of cell assays in acoustic fluidics, this is ultimately, that's what I want to reach, takes place in an aqueous medium that have uh, that has um, uh, parameters close to water. So in this region, I'll simply forget about this numerator here in my radiation stress tensor. And when I do that in the limit of the microstreaming number much smaller than one, I have, I, I, I have uh, good news. My radiation stress is a function of linear fields only. Of course, they, they appear in a linear format. So this is um, the kinetic energy density. This is the potential energy density. And this is, again, the Radoz stress tensor taking the real part of it. So you see now that I have a real quantity uh, defined here and this in terms this is you could read as the Lagrangian of the incident wave field and this is the Reynolds stress of your of your incident wave as well which is a momentum flux as I said so, so what you have to do sorry. so can we say that this uh, this okay. micro stimming parameter just says what part of uh, of this of, of stress is coming from the energy in in the boundary in the boundary layer right so how it's important to take into account this boundary layer well uh, the, the this uh, the, in, in, within the boundary layers so this is pretty much the micro streaming lives and if if the ratio of viscosity and and uh, bulk modulus of your fluid, which is related to compressibility. So if viscosity is weaker than compressibility, uh, the effects of micro streaming and the radiation force and torque is much smaller than the effect that the second order pressure brings to the radiation stress tensor. And the reason for that is because this uh, uh, quantity here, the average uh, pressure, depends also on the source term here, at the, as well as in the velocity, average velocity of the microstream here. So this contribution for weak viscous, viscosity limit is much smaller than this contribution here, okay? So when this right. is the case, when this is the case, you, you still have the micro stream in the boundary layer living there, but for the purpose of, of describing the radiation force and torque, if your fluid is, is weak viscosity, has weak viscosity, uh, you may neglect it. But here it says that you, 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 you should be careful when you have like fluids with higher viscosity and particles approaching nanoparticles. When, when you work with nanoparticles, you really see a lot of streaming uh, driving the particles much more than, than uh, radiation forces in the sense of weak uh, viscosity limit um and so if we stick with this with this approximation if we stick with that i have only uh this expression here that i have to work on and obtain my my radiation uh, stress tensor um so I, I, my assumption, my final assumptions here, is that I have a small particles compared to the incident wavelength. So this allows me to obtain uh, analytical solution of this problem. If I don't consider that, if I consider larger uh, particles or comparable to the wavelength, I don't have like uh, analytical closed form solution. And fortunately, not only uh, a matter of theoretical curiosity, but this is what happens in most acoustic fluid systems. So there's two things that you get in uh, at once when you do this hypothesis. They say, okay, okay, I can I can come up with some simpler expressions because these expressions are still not telling you much about the nature of the incident field and your particles. You have to dig in a little bit further 
now. And I also say that the boundary layers are smaller than the, the radius of my, of my particle, the characteristic length of my particle. And that is to conform with the weak viscosity um, approximation that I just mentioned uh, to you. So boundary layers are, are smaller than the, the size of your particle, which is much smaller than the instant wavelength. So here, uh, I, I summarize the mean acoustic fields when I do that. And so here we can see, because my, my contrast surface, remember, my contrast surface is the inviscid region. So I only have compressional mode in the inviscid region. And because of that, I end up having the, the pressure amplitude governed by the Helmholtz equation. And I have an incident field here and I have a scatter field here that can be decomposed on uh, spherical waves, uh, specifically uh, Bessel and Henkel spherical function and spherical harmonics for the angular part, and this is for the radial part. And of course, I have the coefficients, which is read as the wave shape coefficient and the uh, scattering coefficients. And I need to go into the dipole modes for small particles and the long wavelength limit. Uh, I need only to go to the dipole mode because higher order multiple modes die out and they don't contribute much. So this is good news because then I have four terms in this, in this series here. And I can also connect this red wave shape coefficient with the incident pressure and velocity at the origin of the coordinate system. This is just an expansion that you do. This is a simple trick using the orthogonality of this equation here. And if you do that, there is a uh, relatively big leap here. You end up obtaining the canonical forms of the radiation force and torques. So now the canonical form does a huge thing for you. It decomposes the incident fields uh, and it separates the incident fields from the properties of the particle and the fluid. So the, the orange uh, fields here is the polarizability tensors and this is a factor here which I call gyro acoustic factor. So this polarizability tensors carry the information of particle and fluid and the field information is up here, the incident field. And uh, this is the radiation force in the canonical form. And moreover, I have uh, two terms that composes my radiation torque. I have a spin term, a spin from the incident wave. So acoustic waves also so carry spin like uh, in quantum mechanics, relativistic quantum mechanics, or in electromagnetics. You can you can work with this field. I'll show you what this field is in a moment. And I have a spin polarizability here, and I have a momentum arm that is mediated by this gyro acoustic factor. So in figure, it's, it's easier probably to understand these two equations here. The radiation force acts in the center of mass of my particle. And uh, for, by the way, I'm, this expression are for axis symmetric particles. I, I have one axis of symmetry that of course includes uh, spheres. Uh, so the spin, the spin part makes the, the, the particle rotate in the, in the symmetry axis. And the momentum arm just uh, uh, aligns the particle with, uh, with the axis of, of your wave, which is depicted by Z here. And so this is pretty much the three effects now in the canonical form for axisymmetric uh, particles. And uh, so this, this is an important thing on, on the talk. And from now on, we're gonna apply these results. I'll show you just for completeness, who, who are the, the polar visibility tensors. Uh, this R here is a rotation matrix. And this is uh, the, the scattering coefficient. I didn't tell you what, how I'm going to compute these guys yet, but one way is to solve the, the linear 
term of viscous equations for for your scattering problem, uh, either numerically or if you can, if you have enough symmetry, you can do it analytically, for example, for spheres and asteroids. But not many geometries will allow you to represent the solutions with the, the well-known mathematical physics functions. So this is just to show you who, who are the, the monopole and dipole uh, polarizability tensors. And this is the spin and chiroacoustic factor here and then again i have the transformation to rotate this is rotation is because um i have to go from the the particle frame of reference to a laboratory frame of reference which usually coincides with the the uh, an axis of of your wave if you think about plane waves or standing uh plane waves uh, okay so Moving here, just I, I can tell you now the method that we've been using to obtain the scattering coefficient and, and in turn obtain the, the polarizabilities of the problem. We use the orthogonality of, of the multiple expansion combined with finite element methods. So I solve this side of, of the equation with numerical methods. We used COMSOL. And we solve it here, and and then I project on each mode, which the projections are here, and you see monopole and two dipoles. This is for axisymmetric particles. Okay, so in this way, I can obtain the monopole scattering coefficient and the two dipole scattering coefficients. I invited you to get more details in in, in this publication uh, from our group, but this is what it is. But there's is this is just simple numerical integrals that you do once you know who's this guy here in a certain surface enclosing your particle. Um, some analytical examples goes for spherical particles. So this, this result has been obtained uh, by different groups here. And the, the, the main thing here is your polarizability tensors became um, scalar functions for monopole and dipole here. And these functions can be determined analytically by solving uh, uh, the scattering problem in a term of viscous fluid. Um, and you have the torque here for a spherical particle. The only way you produce torque is if your wave carries acoustic spin. If you don't have acoustic spin in your wave, it's not going to be nothing happens and the, the acoustic spin is, is given by this expression here related to the the instant fluid velocity induced by your vibrations um, and another thing is if you have elastic scattering let's say if you don't have any uh, attenuation or dissipative effect your your uh, coefficient here that I reduce the index because particle uh, spherical particle has symmetry so I don't need to have uh, it's isotropic, so I reduce one of the indexes of my of my scattering coefficient. Uh, I can show using this uh, representation, very common in quantum mechanics, that there's no torque in an elastic situation where there's no attenuation. So in isotropic particles, torque is definitely a dissipative effect. I, I need to have dissipation either in in the in the uh, in, in some boundary layer or within the particle by, by dissipating, uh, by attenuating the, the waves inside your particle. So you have to, if you don't have that, you're not gonna see torque. Uh, and then we move to uh, anisotropic particles. Uh, our motivation was to study these uh, cells here in a group that they want to, to trap uh, Leishmania, which, which is, um, which is uh, endemic disease in tropical areas of Brazil. And so we want to model that. And the way we want to model these particles is thinking that they are prolate uh, asteroids. So this was done in this, in this paper here. And the main result, now I think about acoustofluidics. I think about an acoustic fluidics. 
And I have usually standing wave fields. As I showed you in the beginning, you, you project a standing wave field either to levitate, for example, as you saw in levitation in air. So you have like a standing wave depicted by this blue uh, curves here. Um, and what happens here, and then you have forces that trap the particle and the, the solution using the canonical forms of, of the radiation force is in terms of the so the, the 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 force field depends on the sign of 2kz when k is the the wave uh number and i have a function of the orientation of the particle regarding the axis of the beam so to plot in this result changing the orientation from zero to 90 degrees it would be like uh, vertically here and we, we could compare with some numerical uh, predictions as well, and this blue line is a comparison of the radiation force for uh, a, a sphere. So you see that there is much deviation depends on the orientation of your particle, and so you you need to take into account the geometry. This is the 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 message delivered by the study. You have to take care of that. Yeah, Glober. So that was that was the amplitude of F node, right? Uh, so this is F node at, at, at as y axis. Yes, 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 yes. This is the amplitude of the of the radiation force is just this function here in and, terms and, of the orientation. And, and the parameters are something like it's some, it's close to so. It's, what what is this? What did you take? Okay, okay. Wow, well, this what? is uh, okay. The the parameters is uh, like water, and I consider a rigid. Um, object here because well this is all analytical result uh because that was the we want to compare with the numerical methods that also considered as a, a rigid object and so this is rigid here in water uh medium and yeah so this is the result that we get uh we, we didn't use any any or like we didn't model this as um elastic or compressible particle but that can be done but we didn't do that in, in these studies um just moving on we have the torque now and uh, there, there's something very interesting in, in the same incident field in water for a rigid particle uh the torque now there's a sign uh, factor here uh it depends on the the orientation two beta and of course depending on the sign of this function here uh, which also depends on the aspect ratio of the particle depicted by this psi uh, sub zero here um, you find an equilibrium position so you either be at zero or 90 degrees depending on the sign of this function here and what we did here is so if we plot this function for for a specific um, aspect ratios, a divided by b. So so a is the is the uh, semi uh, major axis, and b is the semi minor axis. And the, when you get closer to let's say a line, and you have this blue curve here, then you have more torque, which makes sense because remember this is the momentum arm. There's no spin here. And uh, you plot it, and you have the equilibrium positions here. And uh, because this is this is positive, the equilibrium position here is going to be at zero. So th this, oh, excuse me, at ninety degrees. It's, this in this case was negative. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, so this particle will be uh, uh, transversely transversely aligned with the the axis of the incident wave and another thing for the torque amplitude which depends on uh, the aspect ratio is if you go to um, if, if your parameter goes to infinite means that you go to a sphere so this torque goes to zero as predicted because this is an elastic scattering because this particle is rigid there is in and also i'm considering a fluid without viscosity so it's a completely elastic problem and you're not gonna see torque if you deform your uh asteroid and it becomes a sphere so zero torque for it only radiation force takes place 
Um, with that said, I have a more realistic example here, which is more elaborate example. When you have a red blood cell with the, with the, the biconcave shape, see biconcave shape here, and I have again um, standing wave field, and the particle is somewhere at with a distance to to the pressure antinode. And you have an orientation regarding to the axis of the, of the beam. You have a beta and alpha orientation. And the axis of symmetry is depicted by Z sub B here. Um, so this is the radiation torque. And then again, I see my, pre -fact my, my factor here, sine factor, telling me. So this is going to be positive always. It depends on the distance that I am. But then depending on now my... my gyroacoustic factor by the way this this tau this tau uh, knot is is constant it's a bit different from the previous result that i showed you because in the previous result everything was was lumped in tau knot and here i have a, a gyroacoustic factor that takes care of the information of particle and surrounding fluid and this is also depends on the orientation and with, with the angle alpha. So if this guy is negative, which is the case of an RBC obtained numerically, so this is the, the result from 2 to 12 megahertz, which is very representative for acoustic fluidics, at least for bulk devices, uh, that I show you one in few moment, in a few moments. You see it's negative here, and it's pretty much a linear, it's a linear fit. So the, the particle will be, will be transversely aligned uh, with, uh, with the incident wave, with the axis of the incident wave. So with the equilibrium position is beta equal to zero. And also I have this, when this configuration takes place, the force is completely axial. Otherwise I would have transverse forces as well. But when, when that happens, I have only axial force. And that's gonna push my particle to an equilibrium position. So if, if this, factor here, which is called the acoustophoretic factor is negative, I go to a pressure node. So this is exactly what we predict here. So the particle is gonna to go to a pressure node and it's gonna be facing the axis, I mean, facing the top where the, the waves are generated. So this is the, the uh, qualitative prediction that we do here. So now to the, uh, uh, the, the, the final part of my talk here is we, we built this, uh, device here with a 3D printer. I have glass, I have resin, piezo actuator, I drove at 3.4 at 5 megahertz, 5 volts, peak to peak. And when you do that, so simulation shows this uh, white arrows here that you have a levitation plane pretty much in the mid height of your uh, chamber. So we call it half wavelength resonator. And the background image here is the energy potential of the radiation force that I can compute from the canonical form. The top view also shows me, so if I see from, from here in the top view, uh, that the particles will be pushed uh, to the center of, of this. This is, this is a cylindrical cavity. So it's going to, going to go to the center of the cylinder and it's going to be levitating. And you have an idea of the energies involved and that will give you nano-newton forces. This is picojoules. Uh, and this is the dimensions of, of my device, about uh, four millimeters uh, diameter. So this is simulation, of course, that we did with Comsol. Uh, but we, we built the, the real thing, and, and these are the results for trapping. Uh, we measure that so this is in the levitation plane, so you see that it clustered together in this honeycomb uh, formation. Uh, there is another effect that takes place to do this geometric, uh, this geometric uh, shape. Uh, but this is pretty much in the mid height of the chamber, which is 250 microns total height. So it would be around oh, 120 microns from the bottom of the device. These are um, red blood cells. Uh, they cluster together. And if you look close, you see that the cells are facing the objective lens of my microscope that is on top of my uh, acoustophoridic device. 
and that uh, agrees with our prediction for the radiation talk that will uh, do a momentum arm and set your red blood cell like looking uh you know aligning the axis of symmetry with the axis of the of the standing wave field and this is uh, leishmania amazonensis uh, uh, I apologize, I, I, well, the contrast is not that great, but they're swimming, not in the substrate, but they're swimming freely on the levitation plane here. Uh, so these are three examples that we did uh, here in the lab. And so people are working with these uh, devices based on some results that we, we got. And we, we recently used uh, this device based on knee acoustic fields to do biospectroscopy using Raman um, system. So we shoot a laser here. And the, the, the nice thing is once you form your, your aggregate of cells, this is macrophages with this cell line here, you can choose your, your, your cell and shoot the laser and get the spectrum. Okay, so this is the Raman spectrum. That pretty much gives the, the chemical bonds uh, uh, in your in your cell here, depending on the region that you shoot your cell, they, then you have a, a a great tool to investigate the biochemistry of your cell over time, and you keep the cells alive. But there, there are different methods that they have to fix the cell in the substrate. You have substrate signal, and then you kill your cell. Here, the cell is alive, and I don't have any substrate. Uh, influence. So this is pretty much the spectrum that agrees with some, some previous studies as well. This was recently published by our group. And to conclude my talk, uh, I, I showed to you the mean acoustic fields from, from free dynamics equations and it was the basic principles, I would say. Results for spheres, asteroids, and red blood cells are also illustrated here. Uh, also illustrated. Uh, some experimental results in a half wavelength resonation, resonator was also uh, presented, and we have some good qualitative agreement here. Qualitative, excuse me, qualitative agreements here. And uh, so I think. Uh, that's that's a good point for for the theory to to move on and add more effects like temperature, heat, and, and so on. With all that said, I'll be happy to discuss with you further and take further questions here. Uh, but maybe the most important part: the people, students do a lot of things here: uh, simulations, theory, fabrications, faculty that also involved at certain level with projects that I showed here. And I also have a postdoc, and I, I guess some people are also presenting in this talk. I want to thank NPQ for sponsors, the Brazilian agency that is sponsoring part of this research. And thanks for attending this seminar. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Glober. Very nice talk. So I see some questions from the audience. Uh, Vanya, please. Uh, okay. So thank you, Glover, very much for the for the very interesting talk. Uh, so, uh, I have two questions. Uh, so the first one is is about the the blood cells. So you you showed that you calculated the force on this. Uh, I, I'm just very curious. Is there is a dipole mode um, uh, is much higher than monopole mode because uh, because of the shape of, of, the, of the blood cell, or it. Or even further, is it enough to describe the blood cell only with monopole and dipole mode? Uh, well, we, 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 I haven't really estimated, but I can say, yes, you're reasoning correctly. Dipole uh, is, is, is stronger, but I haven't really compared uh, to see if we can get rid of, of uh, a monopole. And uh, yeah, that's something that needs to, to be done. I, I haven't done that, to be honest, mm -hmm. to answer you. But I know that it is, it is stronger, the effect. But I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't remember uh, how strong to the point is to neglect uh, the monopole contributions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, and another question actually is about um, the properties of the materials and the materials itself. So uh, I tried to, uh, to, to do some analysis between the optics and acoustics, 
and uh, I, I faced uh, such a problem that in a, in optics usually some nanoparticles which people manipulate they have uh, wavelength much um, shorter uh, in, inside the particle so in, in acoustic usually for for general materials we have the opposite so do you know any acoustic materials which uh, mm, which have similar effects to optics like we have shorter wavelengths uh, inside the material yes uh, yes uh, there, there are uh, some systems that people do uh, acoustical tweezers in the geometric a regime that is pretty much the regime that you see in optics mm -hmm. in, in, in a lot of examples that you use your uh, optical tweezers. Um, there, uh, there is a group in California that, that did a lot of experiments. I, I, I think the name of, of, of Professor Kirk Schung, I can, I can send to you maybe later some of, of, of the papers about that. So this is exactly uh, the geometric limit. We worked with the, the, me, the me regime when the, when the size of particle is similar to to the wavelength, because when you, uh, I show I showed you a bulk uh, device, but there are also saw device that you surface acoustic waves and they go uh, uh, with higher frequencies, close to let's say a hundred megahertz, and the wavelength uh, and particles are comparable. So we used uh, me. Uh, theory, but when you, when you go to that uh, range, you, you don't have much simplifications. It seems that the simplifications are exactly as you said, either in the extremes, in either extreme of the, the, of the scale, you are very small or, or very big. Mm -hmm. In between, you pretty much have to work with, with long series solutions. And, and as you know, uh, it's, sometimes it's a bit... Uh, uh, you know, you have to, you have to, you don't have like nice expressions that, as you do when you are in the both ends of the of the scale. Yeah, I understand, but but, but still, uh, if if you have high refractive index, I mean acoustic refractive index, uh, then you have those uh, mere resonant features. Uh, but apparently, it seems quite hard to find such material in acoustics, which is very resonant, which has very resonant behavior. Uh, um, well, well, uh, I, I, I think I, I think you 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 may find also um, in another in another research that we do we we do super focusing okay so we have a, a plane wave and we, we focus beyond the diffraction limit and and that's a very rich uh, mm -hmm. you know physical modeling and then you have the wavelength. Uh, much smaller than the lens, which is just a ball, and and you have also a coronal lens as well. So when you when you go to that, you see different effects of wave guided inside the lens, and you have resonances as well. So you may also, uh, not in terms of radiation force, but in terms of scattering, you may find um, I don't know some inspiration or problems to to model in that direction, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. So uh, I have actually another question. Uh, so you showed us this solution with monopole and dipole polarizabilities. And uh, we know that, let's say, in electromagnetic theory, this imaginary part of inverse polarizability is related to some energy conservation. And it has universal form regardless of the, of the details of the scatter. So could you comment uh, what is the physical meaning of imaginary part of these acoustic polarizabilities? Do they have some universal uh, form? Uh, well, uh, the, the polarizabilities here, uh, re well, if you, if you think about like an electric polarizability, for instance, uh, that you induce a field inside like, a, let's say, a, a medium. Uh, here, uh, uh, the analogy, it goes like you have an incident wave and how the incident wave couples with the scattered wave. And this is the, the acoustic polarizability. So the polarizability factor tells you how the scuppling takes place. Uh, so you have from one side incident wave and the other side you have the scattered wave. So how you connect the scattered wave with the incident wave or vice versa 
So uh, each mode would be related to, to the polarizability. What, what is something more new, at least for me, is the spin polarizability that appeared here. Uh, it depends, of course, on the on also how your your incident wave is scattered. Uh, but I haven't uh, find a, a simple uh, because it, this is not uh, this is something a bit different. It's not um, just incident wave and a scattered wave because if you if you if your wave does not have spin, you know it comes like. So your, your your velocity field is like this circulating. Uh, you don't have this effect, and it seems to be mediated by this guy here, which is uh, let's say a bit more complicated because you have a nonlinear term here. And I haven't, I mean, to, to be uh, frankly speaking, I haven't found uh, a simple connection, a simple explanation related to other fields but on the other hand i haven't uh, searched much in terms of that so it may has a connection and i haven't i, I just overlooked or i didn't really see it so that's that would be so much for now <laughs> yeah that's interesting but <laughs> maybe i'm asking uh, also a bit a bit simpler thing so uh, as, as i understand this imaginary part of polarizability is related to the radiation loss uh, in terms of uh, radiating acoustic waves. On the other hand, you have this point in vector in, in acoustics as well, so we can integrate it. So there might be some universal expression which does not depend on the shape of the particle and which applies purely to this imaginary part. So maybe, maybe someone has written about that. Yeah, well, yes. Uh... Well, if, if you consider an arbitrary shaped particle, because this, these canonical forms are axisymmetric particles here. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, you, you're going to have some different things here because you have an additional dimension to take care with. And the reason I didn't do that is um, because there's a lot to do with axisymmetry in the field. And uh, the first explanations, uh, I, I mean, it, become, it becomes very, let's say, simple to, to interpret the general aspects of each term in, in these formulas here. And if you have like an arbitrary shaped uh, object, the, the rotation around an axis, or which axis of symmetry will, will take place? Probably it's going to be a linear combination combination of both like principal axes of of your of your uh particle but uh i don't know I mean, to to be honest i i believe you can find the canonical forms in the same way or a similar way of these here but i i haven't and i'm not aware anyone uh who has done that yet yes thanks so vanya if you have some further yeah. questions please yeah, I have uh, another question about the polarizability. So uh, I'm uh, so uh, yes here. So you have the your monopole polarizability, and I'm honestly a bit confused because it, it seems to be a tensor. Uh, but uh, as for my understanding, the monopole polarizability it's uh, a thing which connects uh, the incident pressure and the monopole mode. So the both things are scalars, and sh the the constant between them should be also scalar. But here I can see the uh, the tensor value. So why is this so? Okay, well, wow, this, this is a very good question. Um, why why I have uh, a dipole coefficient in the monopole? What is called the 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 monopole uh, polarizability. Well, the simplest answer that I can, they can give to that is uh, when you take the limit of the, of the characteristic length, which wasn't done here. So this is mm -hmm. the crude uh, coefficient. I believe if you take the limit for axisymmetric particles, uh, you will end up having only one term of the monopole. I haven't done that because I was actually investigating that using T-matrix formalism. 
but the expressions got a bit complicated and I got stuck with practicality of, of the method in terms of numerical methods. So when I do the numerical methods, I get this guy, like the whole, the, the whole thing here, mm-hmm. every, every, I, so I, I didn't do the analytics in this part, but I, I totally follow your question and I agree with that. I, be, I personally believe, but I haven't shown. It, it came from the math. This is all came from the math. And uh, when it's, it's known that when you have four spheres, when you take the limit for, let's say, the, di- the, the dipole coefficient, mm-hmm. you, have, you have a contribution, you, you have a, a term that may reduce to, to uh, it, it goes to zero. This is what I want to say. So you would have only the monopole. But I haven't done here. So... I I follow your question, but I ha- I don't have a straight answer. That's that's a good point. But does it mean does it mean that once you take let's let's imagine that you have a, a sphere with monopole mode eigen mode? Uh, yes. Does it mean that once you make it spheroid, then your monopole mode becomes split into three or two uh, mode modes? So the the gen like degeneracy some kind is lifted, and is there any degeneracy or something like this? Yeah, well, no, I don't think so, uh, because this, these modes are, are by, by construction, these modes are independent. When you, when you expand your scattered waves, I mean, you, you rely, rely upon independence of each mode. I, what I suspect is there is a simplification hidden uh, in, the, in the monopole here, but it's just a conjecture. I'm sorry for not being more assertive to that answer. But uh, no, I, I, I'll keep saying this should be decomposed for monopole and dipole. But but Ivan is right. I mean, this expression here brings the dipole here. So something something needs to be considered here. Why is this, this term? Is this very small term or not? That's very That's interesting. A, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So I, I do not see other questions from the audience. So I suggest to thank uh, our speaker once again. Thank you, Glober. Very nice talk. So the next two weeks we have these conferences and then uh, we have Professor Vasily Klimov visiting us online on the 29th of September uh, with the talk on perfect non-radiative modes in dielectric nanoparticles. So we will be back in the domain of nanophotonics. Stay with us. Uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.